In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This week in Discovery class, we did a review of Holy Scripture. We talked about how many years writing the Bible took, the content of each section, the types of literature we find in Scripture, and what re Scripture reveals about us as God's people. Our homework was to study today's Gospel lesson, being sure to read the text immediately before and after the text that we read today. Now that instruction is especially telling when we look at today's Old and New Testament lessons. We'll start with Exodus. Last Sunday, we heard the story of the parting of the Sea of Reeds. We heard that dramatic moment where God allows the Israelites to pass on dry land and then destroys the Egyptians with the returning of the waters. The last line in last week's lesson from Exodus is, Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Now today, the first sentence from our Exodus reading is, the whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. And the complaining and groaning today are much more grievous when we read the text right before in the midst of that praise and faithfulness last week. Likewise, in our gospel lesson today, we hear the familiar story of the generous landowner who gives the same wage to those who work one hour and those who work all day in the broiling sun. We can read this passage and criticize the envious, hardworking laborers for their lack of gratitude. But the power of the story is heightened when we realize that immediately before Jesus tells this parable, Peter interrupts Jesus' other teaching and basically says, what about us? We left everything behind and have been following you. What's in all this for us? And right after this parable, Jesus has an experience with the mother of James and John when she approaches Jesus and basically says, listen, if it's not too much trouble, can my boy sit at your right and left hand in the kingdom? So when Jesus says to Peter, many who are first will be last and the last will be first. And when the landowner says to the workers, the last will be first and the first will be last, what do you think Jesus is trying to address? Now, I don't know about you, but both of these texts have left me pretty uncomfortable this week. Watching the Israelites go from faithful, obedient, loyal followers to whiny, unappreciative, complaining messes hits a little too close to home. Now, admittedly, part of me cringes this week because we have been hammering at home the importance of gratitude with our own children. No sooner is the ice cream cone finished before the complaint comes that we never do anything nice for them. <laughs> but as much as we fuss at them, we know the same can be true for us parents. We are great at praising and giving thanks to God when things are going well. When the seas are parting and our enemies are being defeated, our God is awesome. But when we cannot seem to make ends meet, when our loved one is sick again, or when our relationships are falling apart, gratitude is often the last thing on our lips. We find ourselves in what one scholar calls the spiritual wilderness of ingratitude. We cringe at these readings because we are no more masters at gratitude than our children are. What both of these lessons do ever so brutally 
is lure us in with stories about abundant, undeserved generosity and put under a microscope our deeply buried discomfort with abundant, undeserved generosity. Part of the reason we are uncomfortable is because God's generosity often bumps up against our notions of fairness. Now, I don't know if we understand the concept of fairness from a very early age or if we are taught fairness by our community, but somewhere along the line, we learn that concept of fairness and apply it with exacting scrutiny. I remember when I was a child and I wanted a treat, my dad always would make my brother and me share the treat. One child was given the task of splitting the treat in half, but the other child got to choose which half they wanted. So you can imagine how precise I am at cutting cookies at home now. But our notion of fairness evolves over time. One could take that same cookie and give a slightly larger half to an older child because they're bigger. One could take that same cookie and give a slightly larger half to the child that's behaving a little better. One could give the larger half to the child who's physically weaker and needs more strength. There are all sorts of ways to determine fairness. But God's measure in both the Hebrew and Christian scriptures seems to be that everyone receives God's generosity despite worth or effort or even the showing of gratitude. Take our lesson from Exodus. The people have clearly approached mutiny. Their love for God is buried in their physical hunger and in their self-centered greed. But instead of punishing the Israelites, God lavishes them with all that they need. God gives them bread every day and meat every night. In fact, God gives them a double portion on the eve of the Sabbath so that they can fully observe the Sabbath without having to work. The feast is not a rich feast of wines and marrow, but the feast is gloriously generous and enough. The same is true in Jesus' parable. Yes, the landowner has a weird way of putting the day-long laborers in the awkward position of watching his generosity. But ultimately, the landowner gives everyone enough. He gives the wage he promised to the day-long laborers, a wage that will fill them and their families for days. And he also gives the same wage to the hour-long workers. Sure, they may not have deserved the wage, but the same wage that's needed to feed those other workers is needed by them too. The landowner is gloriously generous and gives enough. I've been wondering all week where these texts leave us. Maybe a little bit guilty, perhaps a bit convicted, and definitely last on the pecking order that this list Jesus has created. But what I realized this week is that both in Exodus and in Jesus' parable, perhaps being last is not all that bad. You see, Jesus doesn't say, the last shall be first and the first shall be ejected. No, Jesus says, the last will be first and the first will be last. So even on our worst Israelite days, when we are moaning and complaining about the very God who miraculously saved us, or even on our worst vineyard days, when we are complaining about unfair, albeit generous owners, we are still not ejected. We are not taken out of God's generosity. We are not stripped of our blessing. We may be last, but we still have enough. Our abundantly generous God takes care of us when we deserve God's care and when we do not. Our abundantly generous God gives us enough when we think God's generosity is fair and when we do not. Our abundantly generous God loves us 
whether we embrace God's generosity or we do not. I cannot promise we will ever fully get in line with God's generosity. I'm not sure we will ever be cured of our sense of fairness or even our ill-conceived notions that we could earn God's generosity. But what I can tell you is that we are not alone. Our people thousands of years ago did not master God's generosity. The disciples 2,000 years ago did not master Christ's generosity. And I suspect we may not either. But every week, we try. Every week, we continue our journey toward generosity, seeing God's generosity in ourselves and in others, being inspired to try again. I'm not sure we'll ever be first in line, but the good news is we get to stay in line, which means there's always room to try again. Our generous God will make sure we have enough until then. Amen.